Those of you who were at Dave's lecture last night, oh, prefer, those of you who weren't at Dave's lecture, we know where you live. Uh, recall that he said historians should have a buzz, because if they don't have that buzz, they will be very dull historians. The bad news for you is that my buzz is numbers and economics. I can see the eyes glazing over already, Dave. Okay. From an economist's point of view, sport is a contest in which competitors respond to incentives. Sometimes these incentives tempt participants to what I call to cheat to win, to secure the rewards, be they financial or psychic. And such cheating normally takes the form of sabotaging your opponent, you know, giving them a kick when they're not looking, or taking performance enhancing substances. However, participants can also respond to incentives not to win, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. Such cheating to lose comes via match fixing, where the result is covertly predetermined. There are two forms of match fixing. One is intrinsic to the competition. You might bribe an opponent to lose to avoid relegation or gain promotion, to improve your draft position, particularly in American sports, or raise your handicap. Or what's called signal jamming, where you try and confuse future opponents as to your true form, or confuse the bookmakers as to your true form. And, and in professional running, certainly in Australia, it can be two to three years before an athlete actually tries to win and demonstrates their, their true form. Now, some of these might have financial implications. Most certainly, money was involved in the second form of match fixing, that associated with betting fraud. Here, gamblers or bookmakers find ways, positive incentives like bribes, <coughs> negative incentives like threats, to persuade an individual <coughs> or a team to underperform in a particular event, and this gives the gamblers a bit of inside knowledge and they use that to their advantage. Now, the problem with this sort of research is that successful match, match fixing is covered. No one boasts about it at the time. Evidence that it occurred is not easy to find, except when the perpetrators have been caught and charged, though even here, when it happens within a sport, the, the trial, if that's what you want to call it, often tend to be held in camera and very little information is leaked out. Sports historians have no real idea of the extent of match fixing. Much of the corruption iceberg is out of sight. However, if we can get sufficient data on actual results over time, possible patterns of match fixing as opposed to individual instances, can be identified by the use of probability theory. And this is the basis of most economic research on competition corruption. Losing to win. As part of their drive towards competitive balance, several leagues, particularly in the United States, have introduced the use of the reverse order player draft. Essentially, this gives first choice of new recruits to the team that finished bottom of the competition the previous season. Second choice goes to the team second bottom, right up so the champions actually get the worst choice in the first round, and then the whole cycle gets repeated. And ironically, this offers a, pers a perverse incentive for teams to deliberately lose matches. Once you feel, we can't make the playoffs, we've no chance of the title, Let's set ourselves up for next season. Let's start losing matches so we drop down the league <coughs> and we get a, a better draft choice for the next season. It's creating what has been termed the, the race to the bottom incentive. Two major studies that have been done, one's on the player draft system in the NBA, basketball, and the other is the Australian <coughs> rules football. And interestingly, they, they show contrasting scenarios. 
Two economists, Till and Trogdon, examined three seasons of NBA basketball in which different systems of awarding draft choices were in operation. <coughs> In season 1983-1984, this was the standard reverse draft. There were, you see, uh, 18, nearly 2,000 <coughs> observations. Eliminated teams, when you allow for the opponent's home court advantage, lots of, there's lots of ifs and buts and assumptions, as you were talking about last night, Dave. Basically, eliminated teams were 2.5 times more likely to lose than you would have predicted, which suggests that something crooked going on. In the next season, they changed the draft policy, and they said all the teams that fail to make the playoffs go into a lottery, and they draw out whether you're going to get first choice in the draft, second choice, etc. The result of this was absolutely no cheating whatsoever. There was no advantage in losing your games. It was just a lottery. They then changed the system again in 1989-90, where there was a lottery of a kind, but the worst team still had the best chance of getting the, the first draft choice, but not a certainty of it. What do we find that happens? 2.2 times more likely to lose again. In other words, the system of selecting for the draft has an impact on match fixing that's been taking place in the NBA. In contrast, studies of the, of Australian football, um, the Australian Football League, the premier football competition in Australia, a reverse draft system was introduced in 1986. What do we find when we look at that? What we find is and you see the number of observations we're talking about. Absolutely no corruption taking place. Why is this? It's because in Australian rules, your squad for the day, uh, 18 players go on the pitch. NBA, five players are on the court. One extra valuable player has much more impact in the NBA than it has in Australian rules football. Now, this is the one I really like. I've called it not pushing their weight. Corruption in sumo wrestling. <laughs> there are six sumo tournaments a year. Each lasts 15 days, with each wrestler participating on each day. Rankings determine a wrestler's social status, but they also determine their income. And these rankings are revised after each tournament. So six times a year, there's a revision of the rankings. 32,000 bouts were observed. 281 wrestlers were involved. There was overwhelming evidence of match fixing. And the reason for this was every win was worth, let's say, three points. Except your eighth win was worth 11 points. So if you've got seven wins, and you can make that eighth, eighth win, your money can go up much more than might be anticipated. You had more to win when you are going for your eighth win than your opponent had to lose. And this gives the opportunity for match victory. Me. <coughs> There's overwhelming evidence of match fixing. Approximately 26% of all wrestlers finish with eight wins. Probability theory would have said that should have been 19%, especially when only 12% had seven wins. It just doesn't fit what mathematics would suggest. And on the last day of the tournament, remember the 15th day, <coughs> wrestlers who had seven wins and were going for the eighth were victorious roughly 25% more times than you would have predicted. Now, maybe they put in the extra effort on the day, but the evidence suggests otherwise. We have evidence about 29 wrestlers who have been accused of corruption and 14 wrestlers who we know were clean. And when you look at their particular fights, 
When two allegedly corrupt wrestlers met in a crucial bout, the, about the one who needed the win was 26 percentage points more likely to win than if they met in a non-crucial match. For two clean wrestlers, there was no difference whatsoever in the win-loss record. But you can take it to stage further. What happens when those two wrestlers meet again? What happens is that the guy who would agree to lose seems to win more often than you would predict. In effect, there's a quid pro quo. You let me get this extra income in my eighth fight. I'll see you right when we meet in the next tournament. And there's been lots of research on this. I'll just put it all down here. Now, why was there no cheating between 2000 and 2003? Because for those four years, the Japanese Sumo Association gave three points for each win, not the extra money for the eighth. It just fits the pattern. It's, it's too obvious not to be obvious. Let's look at another sport, NCAA basketball. The end of each season, each conference has a tournament, a, a, a post-regular season tournament. And then you go on to the major NCAA tournament. Those teams that had finished top in the regular season and had gained an invite to the NCAA tournament failed to win as many matches as you would predict in their own conference tournament. So we've got the, the regular season, the post-season, and then the biggie with the NCAA. The teams that won this did not do as well in their own conference tournament as you might, would have expected. Why? Why did they tank? One might have been a desire to conserve their energies for the big event. They're already there, so why waste, why waste effort? didn't seem to work because when you actually see what they did when they went to the tournament, they didn't do as well as you might have expected. The reason seems to be financial. If you let another team win your post-season tournament, they too might get an invite to the NCAA. Well, what's interesting about that? The point is money. Invites to the NCAA, the money was shared between all the conference participants. So if you could get two teams in, you got more money to share than if you only had one team. Okay, let's miss the next bit out and go this one. Point shaving. This is where athletes deliberately underperform not to lose a game, but to lose by less than the margin that the bookmakers have predicted. So the bookmakers say, this team should win by 13 points. If they win by 11, the bookmakers make a lot of money. The argument is, if you're a really hot favorite and you're down to win by over 12 points by the bookmakers, you can win by nine if you like. It's not dangerous to try and reduce the margin of victory, help the bookmakers and get money for yourself. If, however, you're predicted to win by only three points, to, make, to win them by two or one is a bit dangerous. You could lose the match altogether. So point shaving by hot favourites is a way of letting teams cheat with honour, if you like. They still get the league points towards their tournament, the bookmakers get the rewards, and the players get the financial rewards, and the only people who lose is Joe Public. Now, the first quantitative study of this was by a man called Wolfers. You can see 44,120 observations between 1989 and 2005. What he showed was essentially 6% of hot favourites lost by a, a lost by less than the, the bookmakers would have predicted, which means about 1% of all matches in the NCWA are corrupt. 
Sport's wonderful, isn't it? Two more sports to go. Horse racing. On the first morning in December 1982, a horse called Mr. Lucky was quoted in the Sporting Life as an eight to one shot to win that day at Newton Abbott. In the afternoon it ran and won as the 11 to four favorite in the event. Mr. Lucky, or did someone know something? There was no form. In six previous races, it had failed to finish in the top four. So what had happened? It had been saved. The stable knew that it could beat the other horses in the race. They put all their money on at eight to one, which brought the odds down for Joe Public again, who could only get the starting price, which was 11 to four. This was not a one-off incident. Nick Crafts, economist at University of Warwick, he looked at 16,769 horse racers. You think I'm an Anorak? You should see these guys. And found that roughly 13% of runners exhibited a marked difference between the betting odds in the morning and the final betting odds in the afternoon. It doesn't mean that corruption automatically took place, it does show that there was a strong possibility that corruption had occurred. Same thing happened in German harness racing. Again, 300,000 horses were looked at, the same probability that there's going to be corruption was shown. Finally, tennis. 50,000 observations. Uh, this stemmed in 2007 as the Polish uh, tennis tournament Top seed uh, Nikolai Davidenko was playing. He was ranked fourth in the world. He was one set up. And the bookmaker's odds showed his opponent, ranked 87th in the world, was still favourite to win the match. Davidenko then defaulted. He was injured. Was, and this was just, again, the tip of the iceberg. It showed how much corruption was going on in tennis. You allow for skill differentials. Uh, the basic argument is, if you're going to default, you're not going to play three sets, you'll, you'll just lose two sets to nil, you won't go for tie breaks. When you allow for all these things, again, the figures suggest possibly 1% of tennis matches on the tour are corrupt. Okay, there's some economics for you. I'm not going to explain it, but that's how econo economists explain sports corruption. Economic actors seem to seek to maximise what they term utility in financial terms, using both real and psychic income. Essentially, the athlete or official undertakes a personal cost-benefit analysis. They assess the relative influence of several factors and make a decision. Is it worth cheating today? Will we benefit from it? Uh, the theory is not that some people are more corrupt than others, by the way. Uh, to quote a pioneer in the field of economics of crime, some persons become criminals not because their motivation differs from that of other persons, but because their perceived benefits and costs differ. A middle-class athlete might want a larger bribe than a working-class athlete because the amount of money they make out of the sport. Right, last bit then. Economists, both in these forensic analyses that I've mentioned, uh, have contributed to the discussion of what causes corruption to take place in sport. Is it just bad people? And prime attention has been given to, to three factors. One is the pecuniary rewards for being corrupt and non-corrupt. Payment of players is a major factor here. The English footballers who cheated in the 1950s were subject to maximum wage legislation. The Pakistani cricketers who have been corrupt in the 1990s and early 2000s uh, were victims of the lack of payment in their national cricket system. And the poor rewards for many British racehorse trainers tempt them to make use of inside information. So one thing then is the low level of reward for being honest in the sport. Another aspect of income affects corruption decisions is the distribution of prize money. If it's extremely asymmetrical, there's a lot more going to the winner out of proportion to what a loser might get in the early rounds. 
it might be worth an early round person throwing a game. They can make more money from a bribe than they can get for losing anyway in that particular match. So why not conserve your energy for another day and just take the money and run? The third thing, is an interesting one, is tournament structures can have unintended consequences where trying your hardest to win is not the optimal strategy. And I'll end with this one. It's the 1994 Shell Caribbean Football Cup. The rules stated there could be no draws. So if you were level at full time, you went into extra time, and whoever got the first goal, the so-called golden goal, was awarded a 2-0 victory. Why, I don't know, but that's what the rules said. Barbados were playing Granada. Barbados needed two goals to go through. Granada could go through if they lost by only one goal. So Barbados are cruising along till the 85th minute, cruising along 2-0 ahead, going to go through to the finals, and Granada break away and score a goal. 2-1. Granada will go through, Barbados will go out. So Barbados need to convert that 2-1 win to a 2 all draw. So they kick one into their own goals. Right? They get the ball, they run back to their own goalkeeper, they go, keep it up with the keeper, keep it lies on the floor, and the full-back smashes it into the net. It's a video, by the way, go on YouTube, it's good. So it's now 2 all. So uh, there's a chance of a golden goal if, it, if it's like that in the 90th minute, and Barbados will still go through. But Granada, knowing if they lost 3-2, they would go through. So they immediately get the ball and run towards their goals to try and score an own goal. So the Barbados players are defending their own goal to stop them losing the match, and they're defending Granada's goal to stop Granada putting their own goal in. That was an unintended consequence of the competition rules. Right, conclusion. It has to be emphasised that not every unexpected result is due to max fixing. One of the delights of sport is its unpredictability. Even if obvious defensive lapses occur, blatant rule transgressions are ignored by the officials, double faults are served in a tie-break, and Mario did that in the week, it does not mean that corruption has occurred. Players and referees like academics, have off days and make unintended errors. However, large-scale data analysis can reveal patterns of behaviour which can raise suspicions of systematic corruption. It will not identify instances of malfeasance, which I think that should be a much less concern to a sport than the possibility which the large databases reveal, the possibility of widespread rule-breaking. Thank you. Well, one idea is once you get through the first round, then you make money. So there's no point in cheating after, after round one. Uh, someone's got to offer you the bribe. And it all depends what, what the max fit. And most of this money is coming out, out of uh, Malaysia and Japan. Uh, which one do they identify? Do they say, oh, that, that Paul, he looks, he looks like he'd, we could bribe him. <laughs> He's got a drug problem. His, his wife doesn't know about his girlfriend. You know, we'll go for him. That's, so it's, this is one of the, you know, that, that whole formula, I don't want to go into it. But I, do, I will in the published paper, so you can bore yourself with that. But these variables are all, all interact against each other. So it's the bookmakers picking the person they're going to lean on, if you like. Dan. Um, because you, I suppose a person can hide 
in the team. So, but I, I wouldn't say, you know, uh, professional running is corrupt. Professional tennis is a degree of corruption. Um, golf, now I will predict golf will go this way now they've brought in the new system of three rounds of stroke play and then playoffs for the last one. It'll be a, of an advantage to get a certain position in the playoff. Are you going to play the, the weakest guy, weakest of the 12 that have gone through? Oh, sorry, 24. The weakest of the 24 that have gone through? Or are you going to get in the middle and have an opponent of equal ability for the, the match play? Uh, no, it's just, just been brought in. It was tested out in Perth uh, two weeks ago. Right. The idea is they're trying to make it more exciting for, for the cust paying customer. Head to head. Yeah. Ian? If it's a team sport, so there's the problem that you've got to get people to collaborate and agree. And also you increase the uh, charts for either bribery or the sort of the great yeah. so, so it's all this, isn't it? Like the thought, you know, the, the, the contact would save uh, the individual sort of, uh, sort of serving. Yeah. Um, Somebody paid uh, a sort of fox or whatever. Yeah, a lot of this now is um, based on online betting. Uh, which has become, become global, and they're not, you, they're not looking for a, a referee who gives seven penalties to, to one side. Uh, Reed Declan Hill, I think his name is, called, a book called The Fix. He's a, he's a, he is a sociologist, but we can live with that. Uh, and he does the mechanics of ma match fixing in team sports. And two things happen. One, if it's going to be based on the score, it will happen very early in the game. So you're not getting to the 86th minute and thought, my God, we haven't, we're not going to, going to make this. The, 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 it's determined by half time. But a lot of the betting now is first red card, yellow card. Who's going to get the throw-ins? And all this is susceptible to one individual on the team. Most of the bodies don't give us stuff. <laughs> See, I, I, I'm working something wrong. I'm trying to prove that sporting integrity doesn't matter. Unless it's so blatant, people will still turn up and watch the games. So, OK, the, the Caribbean football tournament rules got changed because that was so, so blatant. But there's a few corrupt sports that have disappeared. Professional prize fighting. Is one. Most sports, the people still go along. Horse racing is more popular than it's been for a long time. And yet, you ask the average punter, and they say, Oh, yeah, it's corrupt, but we, we know where it's corrupt, we can beat that. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the ruling bodies, yeah, there's lots of uh, panels of integrity being set up. There's about eight reports come out in the last decade for, for different sports. Uh, what they're trying to do is get information from the betting industry. Uh, and liaise with them so they can find out what's, they can predict what's likely to happen before it actually happens and then they can take action. <coughs> but it's usually the small fry that's caught, not the big people. Yeah. I think the individual sports, um, you think back to the like, 19th century, the board of the Scotland for professional athletes and the number of athletes that have a series of off, off days. Mm. Well, wherever you get handicapping, you're going to get cheating because you're trying to beat the handicapper. Uh, can I end it with last story? Mike Huggins. You all remember? Oh, no, Mike Huggins. He used to own greyhounds when he was a schoolboy. And they had this dog and it was going to win. And they put all their pocket money on it. And when the traps opened, it couldn't get out. The bookmakers had put some line off in the trap and the dog scratching and couldn't go forward at all. I'll, I'll finish with, with one question then, because it goes back to the comment you just made about hunters don't worry about the integrity of the sport. It always surprised me at the end of the 19th century when 
everybody knew that professional swimming and professional running was corrupt, but they still drew crowds, smaller crowds, but they still drew crowds. So do you genuinely believe that people, as spectators, don't care whether it's a, a level playing field or, or are they so... I think they think it will balance out. All right, OK. But, I mean, Jeff, the stuff you let me on the... the I can't remember, it wasn't tanking, something like that. I mean, there were still large crowds going to those events. Yeah, there's plenty of evidence. Yeah. Victoria, yeah. Oh, yeah. What was happening towards the end of Victoria, yeah, is that there were so few professionals that you needed other people to make the race up as well. Yeah. So the professional would effectively be giving an exhibition in the context yeah. of a race, and the real race, if there was one, was happening behind it. Sure. Thank you very much, Ryan.